Good morning and welcome to this morning's session, Sex Tech and Innovation. My name is Jessica Platt and I'm an anthropologist and insights researcher at Cambridge Design Partnership. We are a global insight research, design and technology development partner, working on both consumer and healthcare products with offices in Cambridge, UK and Raleigh on the east coast of the US. My guest today is Bryony Cole. Bryony has been a pioneering voice in sex tech and is the world's leading authority on this subject. She's the founder of Future of Sex, a top rated podcast and Sex Tech School, an accelerator program that focuses on the sex tech industry. Brightly, thank you so much for joining me today. I would say good morning. <laughs> I think it's evening for you. That's right. That's right. The evening time. But I'm just so happy to be here and to be talking about sex tech with you today. I'm so happy to have you here. Um, I've been really looking forward to this conversation. And I am sure that our audience is going to be absolutely intrigued by our topic today. Um, <laughs> so I'd love to begin with, you know, the question, what is sex tech? Great, great way to kick things off. What is sex tech? If you, this is the first time you've heard sex tech, you've probably got ideas that we're going to talk about sex robots or something far out. But the way I like to think about sex tech is really something that impacts all of us and impacts all our lives because we all use technology and we all have our sexuality. And so sex tech to me is any technology that's used or designed to enhance um, our sexuality. So if we think about that word, Jessica, just for a second to split off and give everyone a sex tech 101, if we think about that word sex tech, that is the compound of two terms, sexuality and technology. And so sexuality, it means much more than just an orgasm or you know a partner. Our sexuality is how we move in the world. It's our self-expression. It's also things like education, how we learn about ourselves and others. It's health. It's also, you know, as much as it is about the pleasurable sides of our sex and sexuality, it's also about the painful sides or the protection like human trafficking, um, crime and violence, and how all this big bubble of sexuality, how does that intersect with technology? And when I talk about technology, I'm really describing a tool that we use to achieve a goal. So again, people think it's got to be far out robotics or XR, some sort of mixed realities, VR. Um, and it is, and I think you're not wrong when we talk about sex tech, we also talk about sex robots. But if we think about the technology that we use in our everyday lives, like you know, our smartphones, um, robots in our pocket, uh, like websites, apps, tools, or just even, um, for me, wearables in terms of sex tech, that also sits under this big umbrella of sex tech. So um, there's your primer. If you're thinking about the word sex tech, take it out to sexuality and technology and how those two intersect and you have the whole entire sex tech industry. And from that, it almost sounds like the technology is not really even the primary driver. It's about this kind of experience and way of exploring sexuality and and technology is one of the ways that we can do that. Yeah, I just see it as this this vehicle, you're right, to to experience and to express ourselves. And you know, sometimes I just think technology is so pervasive. We we might may as well not have it on the end of sex tech. But what it does is um, by labeling it sex tech, just like we label fintech or edtech, is it gives people permission to, to put this industry on conference agendas, at dinner tables, to be able to talk about it. When we talk about maybe the apps that we're using for sex education or sex therapy, yeah, the technology is really the tool. And what's interesting about sex tech is actually the cultural conversation that's going on and the conversation we're having with our partners and our experiences which are much more around sexuality. That, that's sort of the interesting stuff, I think, and the stuff that's probably a bit further behind in terms of um, where we'd like to be in 2021, normalising the conversation around sex. Yeah, that's so true. And so looking back over kind of the past five years, I suppose, um, how do you think that technology has impacted the way that we seek intimacy or connection? Oh my gosh, 
so much. I mean, we just think about how the world has changed in the last 18 months. And I know everyone's, you know, sick, we're sick of talking about this, but we think about how much um, it's shaped our intimate lives, whether that's, you know, dating, whether that's the online, you know, entertainment, should we call it, of adult content, or whether that's the influx of using toys or, you know, different different ways to experience sex when you're isolated or perhaps you're in lockdown and stuck with your partner at home and thinking how do I solve my marriage or how do I introduce some novelty into it so I think technology has radically changed the way we experience connection with one another and that doesn't have to be physical intimacy again when people think about sex tech they think it must mean sex but if we think about emotional intimacy which is just as valid in our sexuality um, intellectual intimacy all these things we seek when we seek relationships with one another the way that we use technology to do that now is so different um, primarily because of our smartphones excuse the snazzy case <laughs> i think that's been the biggest change in how we intimately connect with one another even if we're coupled um, long distance relationships certainly got a good go so um, I guess I'm coming back to your, how technology has impacted it. The, the short answer is, my gosh, a lot, and it's only going to continue to. Yeah, absolutely. So it sound, the impact is vast. And so, you know, it sounds like the scope of the opportunity for sex tech is really big as well. I know that you've talked about like $30 billion industry. Um, what, you know, how do you define the size of the sex tech market? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I was thinking $30 billion industry, we use that term once, sometimes we use $122 billion industry. Um, the fascinating thing about trying to find a market size for a sector like sex is it is so broad and it's also so taboo. So no one's really doing the research, um, no one's really building the data, it's very early days to look at how broad is the market or what is the actual market size. So those figures that we see circulating in media that are really impressive, you know, $30 billion or 122 or something now, um, in sex tech, uh, numbers that are drawn from different facets of sex tech. I think the $30 billion one was um, a couple of years ago and just some guy wrote a blog post on Medium and it soon, you know, the figure got quoted on The Guardian and then everyone was quoting it. But he was looking at um, dating and porn and um, I believe toys as his $30 billion. The $122 billion figure that's floating around now looks at what the sexual wellness industry is defined as sexual wellness and that's lubes, toys, um, condoms, protection devices, you know, pain devices, things that are used for sex. So it's it's actually quite hard to get a number. Yeah. It is impressive, but it's actually, it's so grey, you know, it's so around the, it's, there's no edges to it. And that's, that's also what makes it hard to define, but great to be in because there's so much potential. So when I think about um, talking to my students about market sizes or how do we, how do we, how do we ascertain how big the opportunity is here? One way I go about it is looking to adjacent markets like femtech, um, which you know it's almost like a nice little Venn, Venn diagram there, and looking at their there's solid numbers there and how much it's grown over the past five years has just been phenomenal. And we can see the investments that have gone in, we can see the innovation that's gone in a lot clearer because there's infrastructure there. So I often say, hey, look, sex tech's about five to 10 years behind in the growth rate. Um, so if you're looking for a, a murky number, sure, use one of the billions. But um, if you're looking to sort of figure, figure out where this is going, I look to yeah, adjacent markets like femtech. Yeah, brilliant. Um, I find it very interesting that you say this is kind of grey, because I suppose working in um, working in consumer, working in healthcare, I'm very aware of how black and white a lot of those areas are, especially when it comes to things like regulation. It's very tight. It's very watched. Is is sex tech very regulated at the moment? Yeah, so the, it's the Wild West is how it feels like in one sense. And I'll explain that a bit more because there's another side to it that's highly regulated. What's regulated, um, what's unregulated is kind of, 
the innovation around um, data collection, um, what we're doing, you know, with sex robots and things that are kind of polarizing innovations. They'll either instill you with total fear that we're all, you know, headed towards a terrible future or very hopeful and this is an interesting innovation, but there's no real governing body to sex tech, which means it's so nebulous and there's, you know, there's, there's no real guardrails in terms of regulation and ethics and the, the North Star of where the industry is going. But on the other hand is this insanely limiting regulated side to it because all of sex tech is classified as adult content, you know, and so mm -hmm. even things like, um, you know, assault reporting apps may end up in the porn bucket just because, um, a, there's no, there's no other way to regulate it right now, and B, probably the stigma and the the morality issues that people have around working around, you know, allowing their tech platform or a manufacturer or a VC to be involved in sex. So, yeah, it's funny. It's like if you if you looked from a distance, you'd say, oh gosh, this is too hard. This is an impossible industry because you know there's so much censorship around. Anything, any step you try and make, if you're trying to advertise on Facebook, you'll probably not be successful. If you try and raise money, it's you're going to have to find someone that's open to investing in something that has stigma and cultural taboo. Um, if you're trying, you know, and the list goes on. But if you you really look at the ground floor and that edge of innovation is highly <laughs> unregulated. You know, people are doing really interesting things with more sophisticated technology. Like deep fakes and stuff like that, but um, there's no there's no like central hub or association to to regulate that, and that's for me part of why I've started developing the school and looking at building infrastructure like directories and those sorts of things because I think that that may provide everyone with some momentum to move forward in a way that's attractive to the outside from investors and other people looking to get in the field. Yeah. And that's really interesting because I think some people assume that regulation will inhibit innovation, but actually you describe it as something that will give us, like, give people momentum. Um, so do you think there's a very, po is there a positive side to regulation as well? Yeah, for me, I feel like that because I feel like the industry, the founders and the people that are involved, because there's no governing body, it's so disparate, you know, and people are working in different pockets and not connected. And I'm a community builder by heart. Before I was in sex tech, I was in tech and building communities. And I really see the value of that, of bringing together industry to work together. Even if you're competitors, it's sort of together you move faster. And I think having those regulations helps. I also think obviously talking to people that are building it or experiencing the product also helps decide that direction. It doesn't happen in a vacuum. But yeah, in the absence of it, I just feel there's no there's no center point, you know, there's no anchor for or rudder probably, using lots yeah. of sailing exam uh, metaphors and I don't sail so I don't explain <laughs> Okay, so it's all about, it's kind of about that direction, about that movement and about making sure that people are moving together, I suppose. Yeah, I mean, I'm concerned, as I think a lot of people are, about the future of sex because of the concerning factors that can't be ignored around, um, you know, protection, child protection, things that are really hard to talk about, you know, in terms of grooming, how we're using technology for finding partners but maybe the wrong partners or there's lots of reasons why there should be regulation and there should be direction um, creating products without consulting with the communities whether that's a disability community or something else. so I just feel like yeah I feel I do feel quite strongly that it needs something and maybe maybe it's less rules and more more association or a, a, a body to lobby yeah. the, the people making the bigger rules on tech platforms but there's a lack of organization, which makes it exciting, but also slow. Yeah. Okay. That's, um, that's a really exciting, it's a really exciting challenge. I think it sounds to, to get your teeth into, but also quite huge. Um, but you said just then about the things that we fear about the future of sex. And I mean, I certainly know that when I start, you know, when I started researching for this and things, I was like, Oh God, are we all going to be replaced by machines? I think that's the question that everyone kind of that springs to mind. And 
what do you think? I mean, the movies are all suggesting that we're going to be like replaced by Siri at any moment. So what do you think is the future of sex in that way? Yeah, I think that's, you know, that's a valid question. And I just saw another German film come out. I was like, do we need another robot movie? But um, yeah, I think the for me, it comes down to our humanity and less about where technology is going, but more thinking about how humans use or abuse technology, right, and, and what we want out of relationships. Certainly, it's the future of sex. It's also the present of sex for some people already living with you know, sex dolls, which aren't that far removed from sex robots. But for me, on a more mainstream general population level, I don't think we're going to get to a point where we're fully going to rip and replace another human with a robot. We might do it for specific tasks. Um, and we certainly already do that. For instance, I've got my robot vacuum over there, and that's much better than me or anyone else vacuuming. But I think the when we think about this in the context of sexuality, of sex, of intimacy, and what really we want when we connect with one another is, you know, emotional, intellectual, spiritual connection, as well as physical pleasure, then humans are really good at that, actually. Like humans probably have a bit more of a special skill than technology at the moment because of our right sides of our brains, which allow us to be super creative or imaginative or spontaneous. The left side of the brain, you know, is pretty much beat by computers or technology in terms of doing spreadsheets or algorithms and logic. But I think that's that's my hope, at least for the future of sex, when I know people express that sort of like, you know, fear that we're all gonna be replaced is I think, I think we're all still going to want that spontaneity and imaginative partner and person in our life that it's really gonna be hard to replicate with technology. That's reassuring. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, and we can explore, like, maybe there, I, I don't think it's out of the question, as optimistic as I am, I, I don't think it's out of the question that some people will have both a partner and a robotic girlfriend or boyfriend. And to, and that's quite horrifying to some people too. Um, for me, you know, and I think that's going to be such an individual negotiation. The other question that always comes up is like, is, you know, being with a robot, sex with a robot cheating and it's like well it depends really about you and how you define cheating and is watching porn cheating you know everyone has their own set of what's what in relationship and often it changes from relationship to relationship and i think we also all have our own relationships with technology and how we use it or how we use social media or not we only have our own set of rules so i've got to give humans more credit <laughs> not being totally blind. I mean, like, oh, yeah, I saw this in the shop the other day. I think I'll buy it and use that instead of like having a relationship with a human. At least, yeah. you know, that's my my thinking for now. <laughs> yeah. So it sounds like in terms of cultural ideas of of sex and what sex is, we're going to have to do a lot of a lot of thinking as a community to and and in our own relationships to under to negotiate that. Um, but I'd love to talk a little bit more about culture and, you know, as an anthropologist, I know that culture has such a huge impact on the way that we approach sex with or without technology. Um, and, you know, I, what does this mean for sex tech? So are the, are the opportunities different in different cultures around the world? Oh, my gosh, yes. Um, it is so interesting just to see how innovation springs up in different cultures um, around sex and sexuality and how different it is. Um, and I think that's true for any technology, but fascinating to see, you know, whenever I'm going to speak in another country and looking at, well, what sex tech have they developed in that country? And I remember the, the most shocking one for me was in South Africa and looking at um, a device called the Rapax, which is a female condom that's fitted with barbs that's designed to prevent rape and designed in a country where uh, rape occurs every 17 seconds that kind of makes sense but designed mm -hmm. here in Australia would females wear a condom that's fitted with barbs in order to protect themselves um, when they go out or when they go on a first date probably not because that's so culturally tied to what's happening in that culture the same goes for Japan I think that's a really obvious one for people when we think about sex tech um, 
how different it is according to how that their sexual norms differ from ours. And so, you know, there's a, there's so many different examples there, ranging from hologram girlfriends, which Japanese men in their in you know the numbers of hundreds are already marrying, and so they're they're fulfilling that idea of like, oh, we're going to replace um, a human with technology. So there we go. There's an example. <laughs> um, to creating devices to prevent groping on the subway, you know, which I consider sex tech too, is like sexual um, violence prevention tools as well. So it does differ on the ground at that local level. And um, I think the thing to acknowledge globally is we do still have a real issue with normalizing sex and sexuality. You know, it's still, it's still, we're still so far behind anywhere that I go and talk to people, they'll tell me my sex education was just very average to, it, oh, I didn't learn anything, or maybe I put a condom on a banana. So I think globally there is a there is a, a potential to, to solve something really interesting, which is comprehensive sex education and mm -hmm. how might that ripple across, um, you know, the conversations we have and the cultures in different ways. I'm going to stop yeah. there. I'll just <laughs> not let you get a word in well so that's yeah it's really fascinating and I think the other part of culture that I'm really interested in is is the way that we have these culturally defined ideas of who is a sexual person who's a sexual being and who sex tech is for um, but in reality we're all human and you know like you were saying about this kind of human connection side of things we all we all seek that so um, you know, who are there people who are being left out of the conversation about sex tech because we've made assumptions that they're not interested in sex or because we've actually made a moral judgment that they shouldn't be interested in sex? Mm, um, I lo love this question so much. I'm going to just geek out with you so hard on it. I think it's such a great, great point because today we see sex tech on agendas and we see it on Instagram and we see it and it, um, we celebrate the fact that women are at the forefront of the conversation, just like we are now, which is a wonderful thing that I think has been driven by a lot of cultural signals. Me Too movement, Time's Up, all those things have galvanised women to go further and um, design these things, like mostly like toys and wellness products at the moment is what you see. But it's a very small slice of, as you say, we're all human. There's so many different sexualities, orientations, people, ages, everything beyond this tiny sort of scope, narrow scope that we're trying to bite off at the moment, which is like the 25 to 40 year old woman who's heterosexual and probably white. So I think the most interesting potential for this industry is in those largely ignored sectors that really need innovation and that have been desperately wanting innovation in this area. Um, and the, the, a couple that come to mind that we talk about in the school quite often is the aging population, because as we age, that doesn't mean we age out of wanting to have connection with people and be intimate. But yet so many, you know, the menopause market is blowing up right now and rightly so. It's a bit late, I even think. But th what an opportunity there for that category of women that are going through a a body and a physical change, but still want to be physical, um, right through to nursing homes, right, where we see uh, in the States the STI rates are huge. So how are we innovating around sex tech for those sort of categories, as well as um, one of my favourite companies at the moment is Handy, which is a, a company, a brother and sister founded it, um, and the brother Andrew has a disability and he consulted with all the disability community in designing sex toys for people um, with mobility issues. You know, how often is it that um, people have trouble with their hands and we don't think about that when we're designing toys or devices or protection devices. If you've got trouble opening something, this is also so relevant for the ageing population. And so Handy's designing toys um, with like this disability driven design focus and it's a huge market that previously didn't have that option. They had to, depending on what country they were in and the regulations, hire a sex worker or perhaps just go without um, pleasure, which seems just ridiculous. So I'm really fascinated by 
all the opportunity that lies outside what we see. We just see this small slice now and it's progressive, but I'm really excited to widen the lens on that. That sounds like such an, ex that sounds like the most exciting future of sex to me. That's yeah. such, a, such an optimistic view of what the future of sex tech could be. I hope so. That's, yeah, that's what I'm gathering. So we need yeah. more people on the cause. Absolutely. Um, well, I can't believe I'm saying this, but we're getting towards the end of our conversation. I could talk to you all day. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, what are, what's the goal? What's your goal within sex tech? And what are you trying to, um, what are you trying to share, I guess, with the audience? And what would you want to leave our audience with today? Yeah, I think at the core of it, you know, for me, working on the future of sex and sex tech has really been my Trojan horse to come here today to talk to you in a way that normalizes sexuality, you know, because we can talk about all these interesting innovations or things that are happening in different pockets of the world. But I really want to leave you with this idea that, you know, examining the sex, the sex, sex and sexuality you're having in your life and your own um, you know, your own expression of that and also the technology you use and how those two might intersect and perhaps there's an idea there of how when you when you do that inventory of how how am I expressing myself in the world or how is my sex life or what could be better perhaps there's something there you go you know what I wish there was a tool for that or something and maybe you're inspired to design and jump into the sex tech industry or maybe you leave here just feeling a bit more like the, the stigmas taken out of this topic of sex. Um, that's the mission, really. Jessica, that's the mission is just normalizing sexuality and doing it through technology. Yeah. So it's all, you know, the idea that, that sexuality is bigger than sex itself and the technology part of it is this very broad understanding of technology that allows us to achieve the things that we're seeking in our daily lives beautiful i couldn't have said it better <laughs> well um thank you so much for speaking to me today um it's been a real delight talking to you and i've learned so much i'm sure that our audience have as well um and i look forward to seeing what comes next in the future of sex thanks so much for having me jessica <laughs>